and welcome to this special series of Research Matters podcast. In today's episode, I, Purti Raman, will be talking to two distinguished mathematicians. One of them is Professor Siddhartha Mishra, Professor at the Department of Mathematics, ETH Zurich. Professor Mishra is an applied mathematician whose research areas include numerical analysis, computational fluid dynamics, computational astrophysics, modeling and simulation of biological systems, and scientific computing. His work on differential equations has applications in broad areas, which he will talk about, and he is a recipient of many international awards and accolades. Professor Mishra is also the winner of the 2019 Infosys Prize in the Mathematical Sciences category. Professor Mishra, congratulations and welcome to this episode of Research Matter Podcast. Thank we you. are very glad to have you here. Thank you. The other guest with me is Professor Srinivasa S. Arvaradhan. He is a professor of mathematics and Frank J. Gaul, professor of science at the Carl Institute of Mathematical Sciences, New York University, USA. He has been recognized for his contributions to the field of mathematics by various honors, including the National Medal of Science in the US and the Padma Bhushan from the Government of India. Professor Varadhan is also the jury chair of Infosys Prize in the Mathematical Sciences category. Professor Varadhan, welcome to this episode of Research Matters. Thank you. We are very happy to have you here as well. So, I will begin this episode with a question to Professor Varadhan. So, mathematics is a field of science which is very abstract and uh, there is nothing much to touch and feel. Pretty much what we see around is in term, in, you know, in the form of numbers and that's what we as lay people are used to looking at mathematics. So, in, given this, unlike biology or chemistry where I can touch and feel, how how is it that mathematics is able to touch our lives? What is your view on that? Mathematics requires abstraction. So there are a lot of things that are happening in the real world. And one way to understand them is to unify them in some sense. Have one explanation for many, many things. That's what mathematics achieves. Mm-hmm. Thank you, sir. And would you, do you have any comments on how we can see the impacts of mathematics around us in today's lives? Everything you do today depends on mathematics. You take a plane to go somewhere, the, the, the wings of the plane have to be defined perfectly. Mm-hmm. The design of those wings depends on mathematical calculations that he does. Right. In the old days, people used to have wind tunnels. And engineers used to work hard to see how to design these things. Now you don't use wind tunnels. Instead, mathematics solves the problem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that opening. And my next question is, with this in context in mind, is for Professor Mishra. And like uh, Professor Walden just mentioned, your mathematics seems to have, you know, solving some of the cutting edge problems that we see in today's world. So, can you give us a broader context of where your research fits in and what are the broader areas of research that you are right now working on? As Professor Varadhan so nicely explained, uh, mathematics tries to unify things, unify physical phenomena, biological phenomena, things that happen in the real world. Uh, Many of these things are expressible in terms of mathematical objects which are called partial differential equations. And uh, the sort of core of my research is in partial differential equations, particularly nonlinear partial differential equations. The point about partial differential equations is that you cannot just sit down and write a formula to, to solve them, to find a solution. You have to approximate them and you have to discretize them, solve them on a computer. That requires algorithms or numerical methods. And what I do at a fundamental level is design numerical methods, design algorithms to sort of approximate or simulate these partial differential equations, understand these algorithms, um, analyze them, implement them, and then work with other scientists, uh, physicists, engineers, biologists to apply these algorithms in the real world. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's in a nutshell what I do. 
And I think you touched upon partial differential equations as being the core of what you do in terms of mathematics. Could you help us understand, uh, one, what is partial about these equations? <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing is about, um, you know, some of the applications that we can relate to in this real world, which have basically stemmed from partial differential equations. Yes, so what is a differential equation first, right? So you take a ball or a stone and you throw it. So when you throw it, uh, the interest that you have is in calculating, for instance, how far it goes, right? And how far it goes depends um, how, how it goes, what's the path, what's the trajectory, right? And that is its position over time. Mm -hmm. So now to describe the position over, so position over time is a mathematical quantity, it's a function. It's coordinates, you can see that. And then uh, to calculate that, you use Newton's laws. So you find that the time derivative of position, that differentiation, time derivative of position, the rate of change with respect to time is the velocity of the position. So this is an ordinary differential equation because this is only one derivative. But now you want to measure, for instance, um, the pressure of air in this room while I'm talking, right? So the pressure of air in this room while I'm talking is different when I'm talking because I'm changing air around me. Then when you look at the look at the window there, while at the same time it's also different in time because when I stop talking, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. When I stop, it happens. So it's a function of various things. It's a function of position where I'm sitting, and it's a function of time. So now, in order to calculate the pressure, the evolution of pressure, you have to see how the rate of change with respect to time is, what the rate of change with respect to position is. Now, these derivatives are partial because uh, it's partial with respect to time, it's partial with respect to space. That is the partial in the partial mm -hmm. differential equations because it's a function of many, many variables. Okay, so this was the first question. What is the partial in partial differential equations? The second question is why, what, uh, what was the, it was about what kind of partial differential equations? What kind of applications do these partial differential equations have that we see around us? Just now I told you one example of that, right? So if you want to calculate the intensity of, uh, of my voice, you can of course go and record it or you can just write down a partial differential equation that perfectly describes it or the noise that comes out from the traffic. Right. This is just a wave equation. Or as Professor Vardhan said, when a plane is flying, the air around the plane, it follows a partial differential equation called Euler's equations or Navier-Stokes equations. Or the temperature in this room follows a partial differential equation called the heat equation. So if there's a fire, the fire will spread, the temperature is going to change. This can be modeled with the heat equation. So you tell me what phenomena you are interested in and I'll tell you what partial differential equation it satisfies. Wow. So they're everywhere. Wherever you look around you, there are partial differential equations. Thank you, sir. That was really interesting mm -hmm. uh, to know, you know, what, what kind of applications they have. So any, and anything, uh, blood flow to your brain or growth of uh, cancer <laughs> in your cells, all of these are partial differential equations. Okay. Anything that changes with anything time. Anything that changes with time and space. Or <coughs> right. So thank you, sir. Thank you for that wonderful explanation. And now on to Professor Varadhan. So we've heard from Professor Mishra about the range of applications that we just spoke about. You also added or gave us an introduction of you know what kind of calculations he is busy with and stuff like that. So as a member of the jury, uh, when you decided to you know award him, what do you, what are your considerations on the influence of his work that has had on the field of mathematical sciences? You know, we look at. <coughs> The range of work, the quality of the work, in order to decide the winner of the prize. Mm -hmm. And we have a group of candidates who are all very good and who are all excellent. And then we have to make a decision. And the decision depends on many things, in particular, what is the field the candidate is working on, uh, applied mathematics. And the question is, what kind of applications does he does work impinge on? We find that uh, he has a broad range of interests and his work is exceptionally good and it impacts many areas. And not only horizontally, even vertically, he does many things that needed to be done in order to complete the work. 
So I decided he was the best candidate this time around. Okay. Thank you. And coming back to you, Professor Mishra, um, you did say, okay, whatever we look around, you ha you can have, you can design equations for us, which can help us understand and solve things better. What about things like societies and things that are, you know, not too um, quantitative in that aspect, but more in terms of quality, uh, human societies, animal societies, do this, does this field of mathematics have implications for entities like this? So, if you talk about social behavior, uh, yes and no. Means uh, but there we are on much more shaky ground in a way, right? Because uh, the point about the physical world is that we understand the physics, right? Or to some extent at least we understand the physics. And once we understand the physics, we can codify them or encode them in terms of laws which, are, which have a mathematical foundation, which have a mathematical basis. If you talk in terms of social interactions, um, Biology is also fine because biology is physics, you know, biological systems are nothing but physical systems. So we can certainly apply the same principles. The so physics is less well known or the biological rules are less well known, but in principle this, uh, this will happen one day. But if you talk like social interaction, people are doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. there are, they, they, they try to emulate what, is, uh, what we have done for hundreds of years in physics to describe the behavior of social interactions. For instance, uh, I, some of my colleagues, I personally don't work on it, but many of my colleagues uh, all over the world, they, they have, uh, there are subjects like social dynamics, for instance, what shapes opinion, what shapes consensus, how people make choices. These are uh, governed, they, they, they form, formulate laws which take, for instance, the form of partial differential equations. So similar principles apply to, certainly to animal societies, for instance, when you talk about schools of fish mm -hmm. or flocks of birds or swarms of insects. To describe these at some level, you can use the same principles uh, as you do for the real world. So indeed, there are partial differential equations underlying it. Uh, there the physics is, or the rules are less well established, right? right. So the validity of this has to be taken uh, in a much more nuanced manner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's unclear, at least to me personally, if um, the same approach that has worked so well for physics uh, works also for economics or society, how, how people think. So this is, uh, but it, it is tough. It is tough, not by me personally, but sure. I, I certainly know people very well who do it. Thank you, sir. The other thing that you did mention is about how do you codify things and I'm assuming by meaning that you also talk about building models that we are quite, you know, use, it, use the word model in a very abstract way saying, okay, somebody has built a model for explaining X, Y, Z. So coming to that particular question and model, as a mathematician, what in your view is a model and what, what really goes behind in developing, what are small tenets that you look at behind developing a model? Uh... A model has to be described in mathematical terms, right? This is this is sort of a basic requirement, a basic postulate. Mm -hmm. And actually, the laws of physics. As I, I just gave an example, right? Uh, just about my speech, my talk, right? That when I talk, uh, I disturb the air, the man change the air pressure. This is very well described. This is very well modeled. I don't have to do it. This was done by Newton or Euler or someone long, long time back. So the systems that need to be modeled are more contemporary like biological systems or social systems and so on. The point is, it's about rate of change, what are the factors that come in and uh, how we use, each model has to have several building blocks, right. right? So what are the building blocks in the model, what are the basic mathematical structures that describe them and then you put them together. So a model can involve uh, partial differential equations, it can involve noise, stochastic differential, stochastic effects, mm -hmm. it can involve constraints. So it's, uh, there is no, there's no particular algorithm for designing a model. It means it has to be done contextually. Right. And in many cases, the models are actually rather well known. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is unknown to us is how to solve them. Uh, <laughs> that, is, that, is the, that is the issue. Certainly in physics, right? Because in physics, we, we have understood physics for a long time, so many issues are well known. The implications of the model, how to solve them, what are the implications, this is what is sometimes unknown. 
in in social sciences mm -hmm. you have to do more modeling mm -hmm. you need to know something about the system and uh, i must confess that uh, whenever i have modeled some things from the ab initio from the very beginning but i have not done it by myself alone i have sat with a biologist or a group of biologists and together we have built up something but most of the models that i work on are very well established they have been known for a, for a while mm -hmm. thank you and uh, talking about some of the um, you know biological systems where uh, you said you do sit with people who study biology as a discipline and then develop models could you give some examples of how mathematics is in the brink of influencing biology and helping us understand what we know as a separate field of this you know uh, science to to make things more clearer for say doctors or medical practitioners things like that what is your take on that <laughs> It's an interesting question. My wife is a medical doctor, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have been able to uh, influence her much mathematically. <laughs> But uh, see, the the let's say proliferation of mathematical ideas into biology is uh, certainly slower than it is in physics or um, engineering, for that matter. It's slower, but it's happening at a at a, at a constant pace yeah. now, and uh, I have um, had some projects where we model things. Uh, I don't do it by myself, of course. I work with groups of biologists and doctors. For instance, a problem that we are looking at today is um, the problem is okay at an abstract level to build up a model for how the stomach functions. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. but at a concrete level, there is something called bariatric surgery, mm -hmm. which is actually popular, very popular in Bangalore of all places. Uh, as a control mechanism for diabetes right and you do a bariatric surgery so essentially what you do is you make a cut in the stomach constrain the stomach somehow but then the point is that the um, biological systems are meant to be robust so the stomach starts regrowing and in fact sometimes it grows even the capacity grows even bigger so what are the control mechanisms for this right what are the what are the biological control mechanisms at a cellular and molecular level so what i work with with my colleagues in israel is uh, to understand this process mm -hmm. so what we do is we have built up a simple mathematical model it does not take into account all the complexities of the stomach uh, we we test the, essentially the carrying capacity of the stomach and then uh, we do that pre surgery and post surgery okay. and we are able to observe many of the things that they they see in the medical data and then the question is uh, controls right what are the systems that we are going to build on top of it to not let this happen to mm -hmm. let bariatric surgery work so this is just an example and uh, the point about biological systems is that they're very complicated right it means it's um, there are many players there are multiple scales so many interactions and uh, but this is this how it was also like this in physics uh, 300 400 years back right and then newton came and uh, then there was you know mechanics came about and then we had uh, electromagnetics then we had relativity quantum physics i'm sure similar things will happen with biology also I mean, it's, uh, it's just a matter of time and how do you think this is going to help surgeons who are doing bariatric surgery to come back to your example it uh, it don't uh, necessarily help surgeons okay. it will help uh, maybe you need uh, so for instance there is a company in singapore which uh, makes a pill mm -hmm. which is uh, supposed to do the same effect as that of a bariatric surgery without doing the surgery okay right so a surgeon is not going to benefit but maybe we have a non surgical non invasive procedure to do that so this uh, potentially i don't know I mean, so i'm not a doctor so I, i i don't know that i'm interested in at least uh, modeling that and understanding uh, what comes out of the model okay I can't. <laughs> I can't do a bariatric surgery, <laughs> to say the least. I prescribe pills. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. That was an interesting example that you took of considering that surgery is so popular, as you mentioned. So, sir, uh, the question to you, Professor Varadhan, now is: um, as he gave an example, we are in this uh, a nice crossroads between biology and mathematics. You, as a mathematician who has worked. 
for a long time in this field what are your thoughts about how mathematics is kind of charting the course for biology in that sense i think in terms of genetics uh, the origins of genetics a mathematical in nature and various uh, ways of identifying what part of the entire sequence is relevant for what is very statistical in mm-hmm. nature and uh, probability theory which is a part of mathematics is is used considerably there So I would say it's discrete mathematics that I am familiar with that plays a role. Uh, he mentions some examples of continuous mathematics, but there is also, uh, uh, see, in some sense, if you take a discrete problem and if the size becomes very large, then you approximate it by a continuous one. And if you have a continuous one and you want to solve it, you approximate it by a discrete one. <laughs> so they, they are both two sides of the same coin. Right. So have you had any experiences with, where there is this switching oh, between? Yes, because I do that. <laughs> this is the one point, right? Switching goes. So I take a continuous problem and I discretize it. But uh-huh. uh, when we model, we also take a discrete problem and we. take the limit means we are uh, <laughs> so this constant this uh, on all, all not all mathematics but many many fields of mathematics this is constant uh, what he does what i do we we constantly use these ideas passing between the discrete and the continuous right so thanks it's, uh, it's a very common trick or strategy <laughs> and one of the things when you mentioned about approximations and trying to look at bigger things or the complex things is, is the field of astrophysics and i think professor mishra you've had quite a few work into uh, on computational astrophysics and astrophysics is a, is a branch of physics that has really inspired awe and wonder among a lot of people because there is this huge galaxies and entities that are always these mysterious uh, you know objects that are around us so Going back to your work on astrophysics, can you please let us know uh, how PDEs, which are partial differential equations, are applied to the larger realm of astrophysics, and what what kind of problems are we attempting to solve there? Uh, PDEs are dime a dozen in astrophysics because it's physics, right? And as I told you, mm-hmm. physics is so it depends on astrophysics has two. Uh, I would say three aspects to it: so observational astrophysics, which is still the core of it. and somehow you need to observe uh, measure things and this is this is sort of should be driving it the theoretical astrophysics which is an attempt to explain these observations uh, a bit theories about why it happens uh, why does uh, for instance why do we have matter in the universe right or why is uh, structure the way it is or why do we have stars for instance or how are stars formed or galaxies formed and then we have uh, more uh, increasingly computational astrophysics and the reason for this is the following so theoretical astrophysics many of the models are very complicated pdes uh, for instance in supernovas or in in the sun or in galaxy formation matter formation and these pdes you can't again as i repeat myself you can't solve them by hand right so you have to approximate them and uh, to approximate them we have to use a computer to simulate them so um, a big part of astrophysics today uh, theoretical astrophysics is computational astrophysics people are constantly developing codes uh, mm-hmm. i myself have contributed to some some codes and they are calculating for instance um, what is the star formation rate or what is the galaxy formation rate or questions like that or what should be the temperature in so on so our big field now is exoplanets mm-hmm. i have worked a bit on that so what is going to be the radiative profile of exoplanet given so on so conditions and then they match the observations or based on the observations they make some inferences about what sort of atmospheric conditions are there in the exoplanet so this is sort of a very well let's say modularized or um, a well developed concept in astrophysics mm-hmm. all of astrophysics uh, is permeated by that uh, in particular i am interested i have worked on problems in solar physics 
and I probably worked on supernovas quite a bit and uh, as I said the equations uh, are the same so <laughs> I look at the equations and of course the boundary conditions can be different the scales can be different the parameters can be different but to me it is not uh, and new issues come up for instance when you go from the sun to a supernova right. the temperatures are very different the magnetic field intensities are very different the dynamic behavior is very different so you have to adjust a few things but to me the equations are uh, fundamental the PDEs are fundamental and uh, so we, we work on that and we also work on very very basic problems now for instance I have been working with um, people in GR in general relativity and they are very interested in black holes these mm -hmm. days and gravitational waves and things like that the black hole binary black hole mergers supernova um, induced uh, gravitational waves and so on and they, they need a uh, lot of computational modeling to constrain the observations means they, they get a lot of data but to understand it they need a theoretical framework and uh, this is provided by computations which is where my work uh, essentially comes in. And you also mentioned saying that in the past 200, 300 years, pretty much of what we see in physics right now were kind of, you know, built with, started with models that have been well established and things. Um, right now, when, when gravitational waves were first detected with the advances in technological instruments to do so, has that had any effect on your field of mathematics per se? Not in what I do, but of course it has uh, stirred a lot of research um, on mathematical questions about, uh, on pure, purely mathematical questions about mm -hmm. stability of gravitational waves, about certainly on the computational front it has. One of the, one of, uh, this is uh, Kip Thorne who got the Nobel Prize, he keeps on emphasizing this, that one of the, of course it was the instrument that really uh, detected <laughs> the gravitational waves. But a decisive advance was done computationally to constrain observations and this is, uh, this is a part that is not given enough credit and I have heard Keith Thorne mention this uh, in lectures that, uh, and he himself has spent quite a bit of time trying to build up this sort of computational models for it. So in my own personal work, no, mm -hmm. it doesn't have any uh, impact. I work with people uh, to improve the models. But of course, uh, this is beautiful, but let me remind everyone that uh, this was predicted by Einstein in his theory, <laughs> so <laughs> it's more 100 years old. <laughs> True. <laughs> and Einstein was an idiot, so there is a double <laughs> connection. <laughs> <laughs> there is a double connection to that. Right? Yes, absolutely. So. And when you talk, talked about computational uh, you know, ability that we have today and uh, with more powerful machines coming in and we are almost the edge of quantum computing with Google claiming to have had a working quantum computer. So how exciting is computational mathematics going forward with all these? Well, I can only say very exciting because <laughs> I am a computational mathematician. No, it's uh, extremely exciting, but uh, one has to, uh, in mathematics, our time scales are long, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, our time scales are long and uh, we, should, we should keep that in mind. So, computational power is increasing, but it's more slowly than before. And uh, what has been sort of, again, not given enough uh, recognition is, not only has computational power increased uh, considerably in the last 30 years, but the algorithms to be able to utilize that computational power have gotten much better also. Mm -hmm. And they are almost a quadratic, so computational power increases by x, the algorithm has also increased uh, the power, the speed of the algorithm also by x, so you get x squared, you know, a quadratic uh, effect. This has slowed down a bit now because the computational power is uh, slowed down and new algorithms uh, the low hanging fruit has been taken so it's difficult to but there, there is a sea change now because uh, particularly with machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, we as computational mathematicians have to use this um, uh, not least because um, you know hardware mm -hmm. is driven by the, the, the things that we compute on is uh, changing all the time so when I started uh, as a graduate student most of the computation, all the computation actually, right. was done on central processing unit, the CPU. True. But then when I finished my graduation, when I was a postdoc, slowly people were using graphics processors. Now graphics processors were used uh, 
uh, started for gaming, gaming, for visualization, right? Absolutely. No one at that time thought that they would be useful for computing, for general purpose computing. But uh, today, in my group, for almost all my PhD students are proficient programmers on graphics processing units. Mm -hmm. And uh, the decisive gains in computing, uh, that at least in my group, have come from uh, on the hardware side from GPUs. Uh, of course, they have also come from algorithms, but they have come from GPUs. With the same quadratic effect, we got a factor of 10 from the GPUs, a factor of 10 from the algorithm, together we got a factor of 100. But now, because of machine learning, uh, Google certainly has announced it, and there will be chips that are hard-coded for machine learning. And my fear is, because of the use of um, big data and so on, right. that that will be where bulk of the money is going to be spent in terms of the hardware platforms. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to be able to use that as mathematicians to predict the weather or to <laughs> make climate models or design aircraft or whatever. And uh, so we have to do this. And uh, already in my research group for the last couple of years, we have started our first projects. Uh, I, I see a very promising future. Uh, mathematicians are usual, as usual, are a bit slow in, <laughs> in reacting, which is good because our time scales have to be conservative. But I think there is tremendous, the questions that come in are very exciting. So I, at the moment, almost half of my research group works on the connections between artificial intelligence, machine learning, and com computational science, computational mathematics. We also asked a question about quantum computer, and uh, I don't know much about it, but I know enough to say that uh, Google made a claim, but it's um, <laughs> still, still some, some ways from from realization, but maybe it's faster than we think. Okay. Because 20 years ago, when I was a PhD student, this was science fiction. Right. Today, it's almost science. So, I don't know. In 20 years, this could be. Maybe there are certain applications where this could provide massive breakthroughs. I don't see it yet, but okay. uh, I intend to think about it certainly. And maybe I also didn't see that machine learning would be useful five years <laughs> back, but now I do see that it is useful. Right, changing so, times and changing. Yes, we, we, have, we have to we have to be we have to be at the frontier. We have to we have to incorporate what's going on, particularly with the hardware changes. Absolutely. And yes. then we have to respond. Yes, thank you, thank you for those insights, sir. Coming back to Professor Varadhan. <clears throat> so, in your view, what's the decade holding for applied the field of applied mathematics? What are some of things that you hope that this decade brings to the fourth or challenges. You can never tell. You can never tell what the challenges of the future will be. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there will be issues and problems raised in the future. It's global warming or whatever it is, and and I feel that mathematicians. I hope that the mathematicians will be able to understand those problems and to devise methods for solving them, and then. Applied mathematicians can work together to solve these problems. So one can't tell what will happen until the problems are there. Right. So these are the challenges that you it hope depends that depends on what comes up. Right. Do you want to add something to this, Professor Mishra? Considering we are we are in a challenging world anyway. Yes, as Professor Vardhan said, we the, who knows what the future holds for us, right? But uh, as I said, uh, the mathematical many of these things they they also pose a very interesting set of purely mathematical questions. And I think not, uh, again, this distinction between pure and applied mathematics is just semantics. Mm -hmm. You only have mathematics when the, so the mathematical questions are already interesting. There are groups of mathematicians who try to even use tools like combinatorial topology mm -hmm. to understand uh, sort of the topology of neural networks. So people, are, people are doing that and uh, at the same time we also have mathematical questions that are unresolved for 500 years. <laughs> we, <laughs> yes, uh, we, we, we have several questions that we, um, as I said, mathematics works at multiple time scales and very, very long time scales. We have questions that have not been resolved for 250 years, 300 years, 400 years. For example, the equations that he is trying to solve, <laughs> we are trying to show that the solution exists. For 50 years now, and uh, 275 years now. Okay. In fact, my talk tomorrow in the, the Tata Institute here will be on that. Means, mm -hmm. uh, as a mathematician, this is what drives me, that to just understand questions like that. So we, op we operate at different timescales. And as a community, as mathematicians, we have been able to 
at least attempt to understand these questions uh, rather quickly and uh, we take uh, our own applications are faster than our own <laughs> you know our due diligence proofs and so on come uh, later so it's a continuous uh, you know effort to one solve long unsolved problems to mm -hmm. one hand and probably approach it in different ways that I would understand with different tools that are at your disposal at the moment compared to what you had 100 years ago maybe and 100 years ago <laughs> 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 So yeah, thank you so much and uh, I think we are towards the end of this whole podcast episode we aim for usually 30 minutes is what we do. So thank you so much for your insights and sharing your experiences and uh, anecdotes about your you know uh, relationship with mathematics that you've had for so long. So thank you so much for that and it was great having both of you as guests in today's episode of uh, Research Matters podcast. So with that, um, I wish you all the success in the challenges that you were trying to solve and Professor, you too in, in, in what the decade holds for mathematics that you pursue. Thank you both and have a lovely day both of you. It's been a pleasure. It has been our pleasure. Thank you.